So today we have an amazing speaker with us by the name of Brian Amadio. Brian is a data platform engineer at Stitch Fix, helping to build and maintain their innovative experiment uh, experimentation platform. Recently, he developed MAP, M-A-B, a production-ready open source library for multi-arm bandit selection strategies. Previously, he worked as a data scientist delivering high-value machine learning projects and solving challenging data problems across a range of complex domains. He has a PhD in experimental particle physics from UC Berkeley, where he analyzed huge data sets from the Large Hadron Collider in search for supersymmetry and microscopic black holes. His talk today is called uh, Multi-Armed Bandit in Production at Stitch Fix. As a quick reminder to the audience, please take some time to fill in the session polls and post your questions in the chat. We'll be uh, answering them towards the end of the, the, the presentation. So without further ado, Ryan, please uh, take it away. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jesse, for that uh, introduction. I'm really glad to see so many people from uh, all around the world here today. And I'm glad I get to talk about a really fun project um, that I'm that I'm really excited about. So I'm going to be telling you about uh, multi-arm bandits uh, in production at Stitch Fix. So rundown of the agenda today. I'll first tell you what Stitch Fix is, if you haven't heard of us, and a bit about our approach to data science. Quick overview of uh, our experimentation platform that we built in-house. I will give a very high level uh, description of what multi-arm bandits are and when you might want to use them. Um, but that's, you know, the theory there is not really the, the focus of this topic, or this talk. The talk is really about bandits in production. So what are the challenges to scaling multi-arm bandits? Uh, why is it such a hard problem? And what are some of the solutions um, that I found that were in, it, that enabled us to um, to put bandits into in, into a production system uh, at a big scale, uh, and we'll finish up with a demo of this open source library called Mab. Uh, it's it's all Go, uh, and I looked at the poll and I saw that pretty much everyone here is a is a Python user, um, but I'm hoping still this will be uh, useful uh, to see how the how this library works, and and maybe you can. You can uh, get interested and go, and, and you can learn how you could. Uh, this could help you with uh, bandits at your own job or your own projects. All right, so let's get uh, my background. So, uh, as Jesse mentioned, I'm a data platform engineer at Stitch Fix. Uh, I previously was a data scientist at Stitch Fix, actually, um, but for the past year and a half, I've been a platform engineer. Did my PhD work at Berkeley, uh, where I analyzed uh, huge data sets from the Atlas experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and then I did the Insight Data Science Fellowship, uh, which is how I, I made it into the uh, private sector uh, data science. So let's talk about Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is a personal styling service. So you sign up, you uh, create an account, you fill out your style profile, you tell us all about uh, what kind of clothes you like to wear, um, what styles you like, what you don't like, and then you can uh, order a fix. A fix is a box of five hand-selected items picked by your personal stylist. We ship to your house, you try it on at home, you keep what you like, and send back the rest. That was how Stitch Fix got started, and now we're into a more direct uh, ordering approach. So now we have a personal curated store for all of our clients, uh, highly personalized recommendations, uh, and you can just directly order uh, what you want. So that's how our company works. Data science is at the core of everything that Stitch Fix does. So our algorithms org has been around since the beginning. We're now up to, I think, at last count, 145 data scientists and platform engineers in our algorithms org. Um, so we support everything across the entire business. Uh, three main verticals you could group us into, the data scientists. So there's merchandising and operations algorithms. Uh, there's client algorithms for things that are client facing, and then there's uh, styling uh, and CX algorithms. And all of this is uh, supported by our algorithms data science platform. Um, if you're interested in, in learning about all the cool data science that we do at Stitch Fix and how it's uh, used across the entire business, I highly recommend checking out our algorithms tour, which you can find a link to here. Um, 
talk about experimentation. So as I mentioned, we have a pretty big platform teams to support data science. Uh, and as part of this, we have uh, an experimentation platform. This is the architecture at a high level of our experimentation platform. And really, any experimentation platform is going to look something like this. Um, so the way it works is you have experiment owners. This could be data scientists. It could be engineers. It could be PMs. Anybody that wants to run an experiment uh, in the UI or through API, they uh, configure their experiment. Um, there's a service that is all about uh, you know, experiment uh, creation and, and updating and so on. Um, and in an experiment, you essentially specify uh, a parameter that you want to randomize. So, you know, classic example is my parameter is button color, and it takes on the values red or blue, right? That's what I uh, specify in my experiment configuration. And then I say, okay, over this certain time period, I want 50% of visitors to see red and 50% to see blue, right? And then the randomization service uh, has an endpoint where client applications can then request the value of the parameters, right? So for a client application, uh, the interaction is pretty much like a key value store. You ask for the parameter and you get back a, a random answer depending on um, you know uh, other inputs like your, your client client ID or, or whatever you're randomizing on. So the randomization service will be based on the experiment configuration. So the, the randomized value and any other things uh, that the client applications need to log that could be used to measure experiment outcomes all get uh, eventually end up in our data warehouse. We then have batch ETLs that run on that and store outcome metrics for experiments and then an analytic service that can then compute things like p-values to be displayed in the UI. So that's a high level view of uh, how the platform works. Okay, so let's talk about multi-arm bandits. So th this, pl this platform really to support A-B tests, um, but we had data scientists who were really wanted to do multi-arm bandits for a variety of, of things. Um, so let's let's talk about an example use case. So for example, let's say we have uh, we want to choose we have a, a huge variety of uh, landing pages we might want to show people when they come to stitchfix.com, right? Um, so how can we optimize uh, which pages to show which uh, to which visitors, right? So a potential new client comes to stitchfix stitchfix.com through some source, right? So it could be let's say clicking on an ad somewhere, they end up uh, on our homepage, right? And we might have hundreds of potential options that we could show them as their first uh, page when they come to the to the website. So, um, you know, an A/B test uh, framework might might be the an approach that a lot of people would take for this. Um, so, I'm going to assume people are familiar with how an A/B test works. But uh, but 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 essentially, you would say split the traffic. Um, some proportion of visitors would see variant A. Some proportion see variant B over a fixed time period, and those proportions are fixed for the whole time period. At the end of that time, uh, in this uh, chart on the left here, once that's done, you then analyze all the data at once, and you make a one-time manual which variant is better, and from then on, you only show that variant. So in this case, you know variant A seemed to be better, right? Uh, and that's an approach. Um, but uh, multi-arm bandit is a slightly more clever way to do things. Uh, and a slightly more efficient way in the right circumstances. So rather than uh, waiting until the end of this fixed time period to analyze the data and make a decision, you start uh, taking feedback right away and updating the proportion. So in the same way as an A-B test, you start off with some proportion seeing variant A and some proportion seeing B, uh, but you very early on start updating those proportions based on the performance so far. So in this case, Early on, variant A seemed to have better outcomes, so you start directing more traffic to variant A right away. And you do this in a controlled algorithmic way um, so that you don't, uh, so that you don't uh, over, uh, over, uh, overdo it uh, too much on, on the early evidence, right? So you do continuous, so Bandit is continuous automated decision making uh, while you collect the data rather than this one-time manual decision after collecting all the data. So this can be uh, a more efficient way to do experiments in the sense that um, you send less traffic to underperforming variants potentially overall, right? You can start directing traffic to ones that are better earlier. You can also um, do this with a lot more variants more easily for A-B testing uh, to, to, if you had hundreds of different variants, you needed to pairwise test. It could take a huge amount of time to do all those experiments. 
with a bandit, you can you can test everything at once, more or less. Uh, and you can also um, you know keep this running continuously, add in new variants, take out variants as you go. So it's a really effective um, form of experimentation. So how does bandit actually work? Again, very high level. Uh, it's kind of a very simplified reinforcement learning loop. So you have a bandit one making the decisions about uh, what pages to show, uh, which consists of a reward model. So this tracks your current best estimate of the reward, uh, or like what you think the, the, the outcome for showing each page would be based on some context, which can be like features that you know about the visitor. And then based on those reward estimates, you have a strategy that says, okay, given what I know so far about all these uh, potential uh, actions, which one should I pick now? Um, so the strategy uh, is, is selecting an action based on the reward estimates, right? Um, so the visitor comes to the page, uh, the stitchfix.com will uh, send what features it knows about the visitor to the agent who will then decide what action to take. Then you, um, then you observe the actual outcomes and you feed all of that information back into the model to update the reward estimates. And that's how this uh, reinforcement learning loop works. So why multi-armed bandits? Um, if we're gonna be pithy about it, you can earn while you learn. So you can reduce the cost of experimentation. Um, you can ditch bad variants sooner. So if you, you, you get to observe, whereas with an A-B test, you have to wait till the end to see if something's performing poorly. With a bandit, you can throw it out pretty early on if you see that it's, it's not working out. And you can swap in new variants on the fly. You can just keep this experiment running for a very long time uh, as like continuous optimization. Okay, let's talk about scaling bandits. This is where things get interesting. So there are three big challenges to uh, putting multi-armed bandits into production and making them scalable. The first one is randomness. Most of these bandit strategies, you may have heard of something like Epsilon Greedy or maybe Thompson sampling. These are non-deterministic strategies, right? So that makes them non-deterministic things are always hard to test. Um, they, you know, they're not repeatable. They introduce a concept of, you know, statefulness if you have a random outcome, right? So Simplest example is if you have a centralized server making these uh, decisions, right? Um, so, you know, a client application makes a request, the server says, okay, here's your random outcome, right? But you have to track what the outcome was to be able to analyze things and update the model, right? Now, let's say the client doesn't hear back from the server, uh, needs to repeat the request and retry, right? Well, since it's not deterministic, they're gonna get it, they might get a different answer. Right? And the server doesn't know which answer the client heard, so now it doesn't know which one to log. Right? So this is a problem. OK. Um, the other uh, challenge is you know, a big wide variety of models. So depending on the use case, a bandit model, reward model can have all different context features. Uh, model training time uh, is, can be different. The rate of outcome data, the reward model output can be different. You know, all the same issues that come up with kind of any, um, any ML ops uh, problem, right? There's all these different models that you have to be able to, to support. And then the other issue that's really challenging um, of bandits is this idea of continuous updating, right? Um, in theory, right, a multi-arm bandit should update the reward model and update its decision uh, policy after every action, right? Which would require this synchronous cycle where you you show a page, you wait to figure out what the what the, the, the visitor does, right? Do they sign up or not? And then you update the model before you can show and before you can make any more decisions uh, for any other visitors, right? And this is just not uh, doing this synchronous cycle is just not feasible in production. So we have to find a way to, to kind of break that. Okay, so let's talk about these challenges, starting with randomness. Now, this is the one where we actually have a solution uh, for A-B testing, right? So in A-B tests, of course, uh, you also are dealing with, in some sense, randomness. This is also a big challenge for A-B tests, right? Uh, so how do we solve it there? Um, so we use a deterministic sampler. So in an A-B test, uh, in our randomization platform, um, we say, okay, let's let's say we want 50% traffic to variant A and 50% to variant B. We don't use, uh, you know, the random number generator. What we do is we say, we take a hash, a, a hash function of the unit. So unit here could be, say, the client ID, the visitor ID. We can do this for shipment ID. It could be any anything that you want to randomize on. Um, you do a deterministic hash of that unit uh, mod, say, a thousand, right? And you get this gives you a number from from zero to nine ninety nine, and then you just apply this threshold. If it's below five hundred, 
you go into variant A. If it's above 500, you go to, uh, if it's 500 or greater, you go to variant B, right? So this works out really nicely because over a wide range of units, you do actually get apparently random allocations to variant A and B, but if you put in the same unit, you're gonna get the same result every time. So that means that you don't have to store that information of what random decision was made every time. You can repeat this process on the client side, on the server side, um, you know, it's always going to be the same. This is also really extensible. It's very easy to add more variants. You just um, add in more thresholds. It's really easy to adjust the fraction that goes to each variant. You just adjust the location of the thresholds. So this is a great robust solution we've been using for A-B tests for years. Okay, um, quite different. So in an A-B test, the selection probabilities are fixed in advance, right? You say, I want 25% to variant A, 50% to variant B, and 25 to variant C. You, you set that up front, um, and then at runtime, when the, when the client application makes a call, they provide the randomization unit, say the client ID, and then you can do the hash at that point and get your deterministic outcome, right? Uh, Bandit looks really different, right? A Bandit has an input of reward estimates. So this is, you know, for each possible choice, what do we think? is the average reward that comes out uh, at runtime, right? And you feed that into a strategy like Epsilon Greedy or Thompson Sampling, right? And then you get an actual random outcome, right? Um, so this is ver looks very different at, at first glance, but it turns out that uh, you can actually um, turn this into a very similar uh, solution that we use for A-B tests. So um, rather than directly using the strategy to pick as you know this the theoretical strategy would do we instead say under this strategy what would be the probability of selecting each arm so in epsilon greedy uh it's you know inherently uh, non-deterministic but you could say if we ran this choice many many times what would be the what, what fraction of time would we pick each arm right if you can compute the probability under each strategy um, then you can actually plug that in to the exact same sampler that we use for A-B tests. You have selection probabilities that you compute at runtime rather than pre-configuring, and you have randomization units that are given by the caller. And then you put that into the same uh, sampler we talked about for A-B tests, and you get out your deterministic outcome. So this is the solution. This is the key thing to figure out is for any um, bandit strategy, can you compute uh, the selection probabilities for a given set of reward estimates. This is a uh, solution that the, the library that I'll show at the end uh, actually uses, and this is what we use in production now. Um, so let's talk a little complexity and how we deal with that. As I mentioned, there's lots of different um, reward models that you might wanna use and support. Um, so the real way that we solve this is uh, let the data scientists handle it, right? So you need to have the right separation of concerns so uh, in this loop that I showed of, of the bandit, um, you know, the platform is gonna be responsible for uh, these uh, selection strategies, computing the probabilities and actually selecting the actions, right? The inputs they're gonna get are the reward estimates that are gonna come from a data scientist's model. So the uh, data scientist is going to um, create an ETL uh, based on our data warehouse, also owned by the platform, right? They're gonna be responsible for updating and training their model and delivering a model object at the end. Uh, and the data platform will actually turn that into uh, a microservice that will serve the, the reward estimates. So you can see here in this diagram, platform sort of surrounds data science. Uh, they don't ever talk directly to the client applications, which in our case are owned by engineering. So we give them the data warehouse, the ETL from, and we give them the MLOps platform to plug their models into. And they're just responsible for all the details of their feature extraction, their ETL, and updating of their model. So we let the data scientists handle it. Continuous updating is a really big challenge. As I mentioned, a bandit needs to have uh, uh, synchronous continuous updates of its reward model. Um, and each we might have lots of different bandits running at any given time, right? Um, so how do we keep track of all of this? Well. This is a place where it's a really good use case for microservices uh, architecture here. So what we end up doing is we have uh, data scientists own their own microservice for their own uh, 
bandit reward model, right? So uh, in the platform owned randomization service, you will configure the endpoint for your reward model for your experiment. And then it's your responsibility to make sure that that service gets updated. So data scientists will train and deploy their uh, reward microservice anytime it needs updating. And this allows us to have each bandit independently updated at whatever cadence is required for that particular bandit. Some data scientists, so in practice, people do batch updates. Some bandits might be running, um, might be updated every 24 hours because they don't get a lot of data. Some might be updated every few minutes because they have a really high uh, rate of data. Right. And then, of course, uh, you know, one trade-off we have to make that's sort of on a is batched updates. So in theory, a bandit should be updated continuously after every action. Uh, in practice, uh, it's not really feasible. So instead, we leverage um, this batch system we have, right? And we were already tracking all the outcomes and decisions storing in the data warehouse. Um, data scientists will schedule batch ETL to extract what they need for their bandit and update their reward microservice uh, as they go. So in a real world bandit, you'll have some, in some sense, there's delayed feedback, delayed updating, right? Now, mm, the impact of, of delaying the updates to the bandit uh, means that your results are not going to be at the theoretical optimal uh, place. And there are some things you need to do, some tricks you need to use to make sure you're updating your model correctly when you're using delayed feedback. But uh, data scientists are really good at that kind of thing. OK, so when we put it all together, what we end up with um, plugging back into our experimentation platform, we're able to leverage the structure we already have um, for tracking outcomes from A-B tests. We can turn that into, you know, data scientists can build ETLs to update their reward model and, uh, and plug in their reward microservice back in to our uh, randomization service for the experimentation platform. So this is how we complete the loop of the multi-arm bandit and are able to run bandits in production. Right, so, um, so so in summary, you know these three challenges I talked about for uh, multi-arm bandit scalability, um, the randomness, heterogeneity of models, and continuous updating, we found solutions for all of them. So for randomness, we just reuse uh, the methods for A/B testing. Um, this means that you need to, to you need to be a little smart, you need to be able to use some math here to figure out what the probabilities are for each strategy. Um, in fact. Uh, we had to come up with a whole new way um, to do Thompson sampling uh, in order to compute Thompson, sam Thompson sampling probabilities. This is not something that's uh, readily available, but uh, in the library that I'll show at the end, um, we came up with a method that we can, given almost any set of distributions, uh, we can compute the probability of selecting each arm under Thompson sampling in fast enough that it can be used online in the request loop. We're talking a few milliseconds, um, even if you have a huge number of arms. Uh, heterogeneous models, um, dealing with that, you know, you need the right separation of concerns. You need to pick your interfaces carefully. Um, so what exactly are we going to get back from the data scientists um, when they give us, um, you know, when we request from the reward services, that has to be tightly controlled. And then we have a platform as well. Our MLOps platform helps them, you know, with model versioning, service generation, and deployment. So the data scientist really only has to come up with, um, you know, a Python object that gives their reward uh, estimates. And they can just uh, we take it from there, right? And then for continuous updates, um, you know, we use this concept of reward microservices. So every bandit can update when it needs to at the cadence it needs to, um, and we can reuse our existing batch analytic system for this. Of course, the trade-off here is we don't have streaming updates. All right, so let's talk about um, MAB, which is this open source selection strategies. Um, so this. This is used in our platform inside the randomization service. So if it's an A-B test, we use our existing software. And if it's a multi-arm bandit uh, in the request, we're going to use what's in this, uh, this library here. So it consists of three parts. When you create a bandit in MAB, you have to specify a reward source. Um, so this is this, wherever your up-to-date reward estimates come from. Uh, a strategy that you want to use. I think we have four or five currently implemented strategies that you can pick from. And then a sampler, we use this bucketed SHA-1, hash. All of these things you can implement your own. Your own. It's very easy to plug in extensions to the library, but these are um, some, of the, some of the base ones. So let's look. Um, we're running a little low on time, but we can do, um, I can show you this demo. So 
the installation is easy. You just go get uh, github.com stitch fix slash map. Uh, it's already installed, so that's just going to take a minute. OK, and then I will show you uh, what it looks like to write a Mike Bandit service that's based on the reward microservices, or at least depends on them. So to start off, I already have a reward microservice running locally in the background here. Um, so I'm just going to show you what some requests to this service look like before we actually write the bandit part, the, the arm selection part. Right? Uh, I'm just going to format the output here a little bit nicer. So we're making a request. We're specifying the source ID. Um, and we're, at, we're hitting the rewards endpoint. And we're getting out this list of parameters. So this is the, uh, we're using a beta distribution is the, the output of our model. So it has alpha and beta parameter for each arm. In this case, it's a four arm bandit. So this is the reward microservice that's up. This is what the data scientists uh, own. And now we're going to actually, I'm going to show you how to write in Go the, uh, the bandit service that's going to use this. Uh, it's really simple to write a web service in Go. So uh, hopefully you can follow along. So um, yeah, all right. So we're going to, we need an HTTP client. So the bandit's going to have to make a request um, to the reward service. Um, we're going to give it the endpoint to use. This is running locally in Docker Compose, so it's uh, this is the endpoint. We give it a parser. This is going to parse the the response from the reward service and turn it into the types that Mab understands. And a marshaller, which goes the other way. So we're going to take the context. So in our case, this bandit uses the traffic source ID as the context for the bandit. That has to be turned back into JSON for the request. So those are the four pieces of the reward source. And then we're going to create uh, mab.bandit. This is uh, as I, the, 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 the three inputs, the three pieces that a bandit needs. The reward source is an HTTP source. Um, you can specify your own. Could be a local source. Could be a database source, whatever you need. Um, and we give it a strategy. So we are, yeah. So strategy, we're going to pick. Thompson sampling. So this is uh, built for you in the And you have to give it, the way that our Thompson sampling works uses numerical integration. So you have to give it a numerical integrator. Um, but we have a, there's a package in MAB, a sub-package called NumInt that'll do that for you. And then we give it the sampler, the standard SHA-1 sampler. That's how you initialize a bandit in MAB. The reward source, strategy, and sampler are what's needed. Um, that's it, right? So from here on out, we're just we're just going to make a web server. Um, I'm going to use this MUX library from Gorilla. That's really nice. I'm going to specify an endpoint, uh, select arm endpoint. Uh, and um, hiding a little bit of work I've already done here. I've got this adapter that will handle the incoming um, post requests. And we'll just call the select arm method of the bandit when it gets a post request. Um, OK, we're almost done here. Now we're just going to start up the server, or uh, initialize the server, HTTP server, um, and give it the handler we just created. And we're going to make it, give it the address, port 80. And that's it. And then we're going to run server.listen and serve. OK, so that's how you write a production-ready web service in Go. It's uh, 34 lines. It's pretty nice. I am hiding a little bit of the details, but uh, but more or less pretty simple. Um, and using the Mab Bandit library to make uh, production-ready multi-arm bandit endpoint. So we can see what this looks like. Um, we can make some requests to the select arm endpoint. Uh, oh, we have to uh, start up the services first. This will take just a couple of minutes. So what's happening here is we're starting up the reward microservice, and uh, as well as the bandit service that's going to use it. Now, in our actual platform, there's going to be many reward microservices running at any given time. Um, but for this demo, I just have the one. OK, so those are both running in the background. And now we can make requests to our bandit service. So let's. Uh, make a post request to the select arm endpoint. Uh, and we have to give it uh, a couple of things. So we give it the unit. Uh, in this case, we're going to use visitor ID. And let's say uh, you know it's visitor ID 12345. 
uh, and then we give it some context because this is a contextual bandit. Uh, and so it needs a source ID, let's say source ID one, right? And there you go. Let's um, format the output a little nicer so we can see actually what we got. So what we get out here is uh, in the rewards, which came from the reward microservice, they just get passed through and returned by the bandit. Uh, we get the probabilities that were computed from the rewards. This is the intermediate step. And then finally, we get the selected arm. So if we put the same visitor ID every time, or if we change the visitor ID, rather, <clears throat> we'll get the same probabilities, same rewards, and a different, you know, potentially different arm selection. Uh, but if you put it in this, the same visitor ID again, you'd always get the same results. And now we can change the context. Changing the context means you get a different set of rewards, so different probabilities and, and different arms as well. OK, so that's it for the, the library demo. Um, we can go back to the top here. Yeah, and so we showed how we can use uh, this MAB library to put uh, multi-arm bandits in, uh, into production. I talked about um, what multi-arm bandits are, first of all, and, and what the three big challenges are to scaling them and how we solve them and how you can use this uh, library uh, to solve them as well. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. This was a very uh, enlightening talk. We appreciate this. Um, just a quick reminder to the audience, the next uh, talk are starting now. So if you want to hop onto those talks, please uh, go ahead. Though we will be uh, going through some questions. So if you're interested in seeing uh, Brian's uh, responses to those questions, feel free to stay. And yes, we the slides will be shared later on on the Slack channel. So please follow the Slack channel of the event, and we'll be able to see all of the recording and the Slack as well, the Slack uh, the slides as well. All right. So Brian, ready to pick up some questions? Yeah, absolutely. I actually saw a good question in the chat already. If I Go can. All right. Uh, yeah. So the question was about um, the ninety fifth. Uh, so the ninety fifth percentile response time of this service under load. So for our core randomization service that uses this library, uh, we handle about 900 requests per second. And we have a P99 of uh, under 15 milliseconds last I checked. So you know this is a high performance library. It's really production ready. Um, yeah. Very nice. And uh, Bushan also asked, what if you have context uh, and it needs feature encoding before CMAP mod model gives the results? Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, so I think um, that sh needs to be handled um, on the reward service side. So the, the, the contract that we have is we've, we will give whatever context comes from the client application. We sort of, our service just blindly passes that along to um, downstream to the uh, to the reward service. We do have some cases where we can do feature enrichment upstream of that, um, but specific feature encoding for specific models need to be handled on the reward side. So in that case, you'd have to make sure that the reward model can be performant enough to be used online. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from Bushan once more, are you saving bandit arm selected results and then referring from the microservice to take the decision of which arm to select? Saving bandit arm selected results. Um, OK, so the microservice only gives the reward estimates, right? So that just says, at, at, any, at whatever the current time is, tell me, uh, for this context, what's the estimated reward for each arm? And then the randomization service will actually pick the arm. Uh, that, that's what makes the decision of which arm to select. Um, Great. So yeah, the model will have, the reward model will have used that information about the past selections to, to, to update the model. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Max. Is there a Python API for this? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> but right. that's, a good, that's a good thing to, uh, to, to, to open an issue on the, on the repo for, yeah. Definitely. Max, if you want to help out with it, uh, you know, hop on the repo. PR is welcome. <laughs> PR is welcome, yeah. There we go. All right, we've got a question from Austin. How do you handle the case where rewards are very rare, uh, i.e. most rewards are zero, but the number of arms in the candidate set is large? Do you, as a follow-up, do you have metrics to measure convergence to the optimal arms? 
Okay, so um, for the first one, you know, that's a tricky problem. Uh, if you're not getting a lot of rewards, I mean, from from the platform platform point of view, um, you know, that's a data scientist problem. Um, so I'm not sure how they can approach that. I think, you know, there's also issues with like cold start. How do you start? What values do you give the distribution in the beginning? Um, so that's a challenge for sure. I don't have good answers for that, though. Makes sense. And uh, we've got a question from uh, Radha Krishnan. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. What uh, specific use case does MAP can MAP be used in? Yeah, so I, I mentioned um, when I introduced the idea, we, we use this for uh, landing page optimization. So let's say you have um, a visitor coming who clicked on a Stitch Fix ad, right? Um, we don't have much information about them, but we want to show uh, we want to show some kind of personalized landing page. One thing we do know is how they got to our page, right? What ad they clicked on specifically. Um, so we can use that information to optimize which pages we show them. We have a huge variety of landing pages that we want to continuously um, be refining. So we can remove them as we go. We can add new ones in. And Abandit is a great, um, great use case for that. We've recently um, tested this for all of uh, traffic for, for men's, uh, men's ads, uh, which is a smaller part of our business. Uh, we saw a really big improvement over the baseline in terms of sign-up rate. Great. Uh, how should I think your question was answered already with the demo. Victor is wondering, does it make sense to implement an A-B test system and then iterate to map or just implement maps from the start? I think if you're starting off, do A-B testing, right? Um, bandits are kind of sophisticated. Um, they're complicated to implement. That's why you don't hear a lot about bandits in production, because it's a hard problem. Uh, it can be really valuable. But if you don't have a good A-B testing culture yet um, or good tooling for it yet, you're gonna. it's going to be a lot harder. What's really nice about bandits is that once you have um, things for A/B testing, like I showed here, it's you can you can leverage a lot of that um, to make bandits uh, possible as well. And I will also mention, you know, you don't have to have your own experimentation platform for this to work. A lot of people use third-party platforms. Uh, I talked to someone recently; they use LaunchDarkly, and they were asking me, "Can I use this for you know? Can I use your Bandit library?" And yeah, you can because. Your input, you know, they all have an API that you can specify what you want your traffic fractions to be, right? For your experiment, well, you could, you know, kind of offline, use this library to recompute traffic fractions and feed that back into your platform. Um, even though that platform is built for A/B testing, you can essentially plug a bandit in in this way. So, being able to compute those probabilities with this with this library is really key. Mm, makes sense. And lastly, from Manisha, could you please give some examples of reward estimates that you use? Mm. Yeah, so simple example, there's two. So a really simple example is sign up rate. Um, actually, let me go back and show this diagram from the beginning. What was it this one? Yeah. So you have um, you have outcome, right? This is something that's usually observable right away. Did the person end up signing up or not? Um, and then you have reward, which is a function of outcomes, if you look down here, right? Usually reward is some kind of measure of money. Now, they can be the same thing, um, outcome and reward. In this bandit that we used recently, they were the same. It was just binary sign up or not, right? Um, but we also had a use case where the reward was estimated lifetime value. Um, and that's not something you can measure right away, at least not fast enough to update a bandit. So we would have these um, metrics that we could, outcome metrics we can measure much earlier on, feed that into a lifetime value model um, and the predicted lifetime value based on those early uh, outcome metrics would be the reward model. Um, so you can see in this, you know, in this diagram, like the, um, yeah, the outcome metrics happen right away and the reward lifetime value is presumably this, uh, this model, lifetime value model is the function. Um, and that's the money, but then the outcome itself that we measure right away can be used to update the, the model. I think that's all the questions that we got for today. Thank you very much, Brian. This was very enlightening. I personally learned quite a lot. So thank you, really appreciate your time.
And uh, thank you to the audience and for those who stayed over for to, uh, to uh, listen to the responses from Brian. And I uh, wish you all a, rest, a good rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.